Good morning. God, you're very quiet. It's not like when I talk in Ireland, everybody will say good morning back to me. <laughs> so I'll start again. Good morning. Thank you very much. Now I feel a bit more relaxed. It's always very nerve-wracking when you stand in front of a group of people like this. I'm not sure if you feel the same way, but any time I do it, I feel absolutely terrible. It takes me a little while to calm down. Drinking water helps. Laughing helps. Before I start, I'd like to thank the Schoolnet group for inviting me to speak today. To be absolutely honest, I had no idea what I was going to talk about. I had no idea what you wanted to hear about. So I said, right, I'll just talk about something I'm interested in myself, which is generally what I do these days. It's one thing about when you're young and ambitious, you talk about things that you think people want to hear. And when you get older, like myself, you begin to talk about things that you want to hear yourself. Sometimes you end up talking to yourself. If you think... It's actually, it's sad but true that most language testers or most testers end up talking to themselves anyway because I was going to say nobody else listens. I don't think a lot of people understand what they're trying to say and I'm not sure they understand themselves what they're trying to say and I'm guilty as charged because I've been in testing now for quite a long time. I work for the British Council as you can see now but before that, for 25 years, I worked at universities where I, I sat in my ivory tower for as long as I could and talked about testing, did a little bit of testing, but really forgot what testing had been about. Before that, I actually was a teacher in a secondary school in Ireland. And about 30 years ago, I was involved in writing and marking Leaving Cert examinations in Ireland in various subjects, which was great fun, but very different to what I do now, which is focused completely on English language testing, though every now and then I venture out into other subject areas. So today what I'm going to be talking about is essentially language testing, but I think some of the things, or I hope all of the things that I'm going to say will resonate for other subjects, because I've decided I'll play somewhat something of a devil's advocate this morning. I know everybody here is interested in ICT, as I am myself, and I love my gadgets. But I don't know about you, but if I look at a computer, it breaks. I sent my presentation along. I had a lovely presentation with lovely images. I came and looked at the computer this morning. They weren't there. I had to reproduce the, most of the presentation in the last 40 minutes. For me, technology, headache, problem, all the same thing. Which is a fantastic challenge because we can't avoid technology in what we do. So how do we square this ridiculous circle? I'm not sure how completely, but we do try. And I'm going to talk a little bit about how we go about it in the council. So I'll start by what I always like to do. Anybody who's seen me speak about general things in language testing, I always like to go back, look into the past, because nothing we've got nowadays is new. It's, it's all been around for years, in some cases surprisingly long. Then I'll have a look at some of the changes that are taking place around now. I, this is nothing new, I hope, to you, but I want to place it in the context of assessment. Then I look at assessment and change before finally looking at ways forward or looking at an overview, some final ideas that I might have. I have no intention at all of speaking for an hour, so I'm hoping that you're going to come to the rescue and come with lots of questions. Even if you disagree with me, please, I have no problem with that at all. I quite like when people disagree with me. So let's look back a bit. One of my favourite testing images is this one. This is the stone of Thurlow in the west of Ireland, in a place called Galway. As you can see, it's got lots of nice designs on it. That was made by my, not my ancestors, I'm from Kerry down in the south, but my wife's family come from this part of Ireland, so I like to think of her ancestors chipping away at a stone. 
and thinking, aren't we fantastic? Look at the wonderful thing we're making. That was about 2,200 BC, so about 4,000 years ago. Irish people were chipping away at these stones, and I think did a pretty good job. Around the same time, the gentleman on the left was thinking something completely different. He was thinking, I've got an empire to run. He happened to be the emperor of China. He said, I've got an empire to run. But all of this idea of nepotism doesn't seem to work. I just end up with idiots and fools who can't do the job. I actually need to get the empire to run. How am I going to get my empire to run better? I know, I'll test the people I want to come into the system. So he came up with this idea of testing them. That lasted for about 600 years. Well, actually, no, it lasted quite a bit longer. It lasted for well over 2,000 years. Then, this guy in the middle, Wendy, as it happens is his name, an interesting name for a Chinese emperor, he decided about 600 years AD, that we need to fix the system. If the system doesn't work, we need to fix it. And at that time, he helped to create the Keiju, which is written there nicely in Chinese, for those of you who can read it. And there's a picture of the Nanjing Examination Center taken around the time of the last examination, because the examination was, in, was developed in about 600 AD and lasted until 1905 more or less in the same guise. It had all of the hallmarks of a modern testing system. It had a certificate, for example. Only one person got the certificate, but it was written on gold leaf and signed by the emperor, so it was a job for life and a pension. In fact, since people retired at 70, the oldest person to pass the test was 80, so he got a 10-year pension backdated, which was very kind of them. One of the problems with the system was that it eventually devoured the education system completely because in the middle of the 19th century, the, the emperor decided, well, we're wasting all this money on education when everybody in the country just wants to pass the keiju. So why, why spend money on education? Let's take it out and spend it on something else like me and let education go to hell, which is precisely what happened. There was no formal education system by the time the empire died in the early 20th century. But they had institutionalized cheating. Wonderful story, if anybody is interested in reading about this in a book called China's Examination Hell by a guy called Miyazaki, Sale University Press, 1963. A fantastic read. I recommend it for an aeroplane. So language testing and testing of all kinds has been with us for thousands of years. It's not something new. Everything that we have, they had. They have examination centers. The tower you see was where the invigilators wandered around and looked at the people. Those little huts that you see were where the test takers lived for three days during the test. And they couldn't do anything in the center. If they died, their bodies were carried out over the wall because opening the gates was not allowed and leaving dead bodies around was considered a problem for other test takers. So that was the keiju. It lasted for many years. Modern testing really started in the 19th century. And in a, in a period of 50 years, we went from language testing becoming part of educational practice in about 19, 1845, right through to some very important changes which saw objective tests being created, first of all, in things like English, maths, and science, culminating probably in a rush of blood in the early 20th century when we had Thorndike at Teachers College, Columbia, who came up with the first standardized scales, which were really fantastically interesting thing. He created a scale, first of all, for handwriting, where he gathered handwriting samples from hundreds of candidates, then asked about 128 of his teachers around the country to rank groups of them. Then he ranked them all, did some basic scaling, and gave them all a number. The, the, the pack that was sent to a teacher then consisted of over 100 samples of handwriting. 
And to mark your students' work, you took their handwriting and you walked along until you got to something that looked similar, and that was their score. That was the first scale for handwriting. A few years later, he came up with a scale for composition, English composition, which was more or less exactly the same, the same format, the same scale. The interesting thing about it is that's more or less exactly what we do today. But instead of having samples of candidate writing, we have descriptions of samples of candidate writing. So we've taken it a step away, which is one of the problems with standardized tests. Standardized tests to work have to take a step back from what they're testing. Otherwise, you're too close to it, and it, it becomes impossible. By 1914, we had the MCQ, a gentleman called Frederick J. Kelly came up with a very simple multiple choice question in the Kansas test of silent reading. And that basically changed the way testing was done. Because from 1914, we could test hundreds of thousands of people very efficiently. The industry really began at that time. So that's basically how it all started very quickly at that time. The, but at the same time, you see there's a bunch of gaps in there. At the same time, people started to think about the science of measurement. The first person I feel who really contributed to, to this was Galton, who wrote his first paper on the science of psychometrics in 1869. You can actually read it. There's a very good website devoted to the works of Galton. And it is quite interesting. If you read on, the work of Galton was, it was very, very interesting in that he was the first person to try to scientifically understand the concept of measurement. In some ways, he lost the plot a bit. And for those of you who liked Sesame Street, and I know that when my daughters were young, they liked Sesame Street. One of my daughters who went on to become an accountant, sadly, she's cured now. She works in the media. Uh, but she was always fascinated by counting. And her favorite character in this whole thing was the count. The count, if you remember, liked to count everything. Well, Galton was the count. Galton counted all kinds of things, and he tried to make sense of them. And in some of the things he counted, it did make sense to count them. And it did make sense when you put them together. In other ways, it didn't really make sense. So things like measuring a person's head, measuring the distance between your eyes to see how likely it was that you would kill people, probably not the most sensible idea in the world. But he did like counting, and he did like measuring. And he did invent, really, and put in place this whole notion of psychometrics. The first psychometrics laboratory was opened in Cambridge in 1887. And you can see all of these wonderful things that happened. Reliability was investigated by um, Edgeworth in the 1880s and 1890s, again at Cambridge. Statistics began to become alive in terms of measurement, again in the 1900s, with Pearson's chi-square in 1900. You've often come across that. Students' T-statistic, or the T-test as we call it, actually written by a guy who wasn't called student at all, that was his pen name. The really nice thing about this chap is he worked for Guinness in Dublin when he did it. So we have some claim to fame in Dublin, in Ireland, for uh, the statistical process. What I found really interesting when I was looking at all of this a while back was a lot of the the testing, the ideas for assessment and assessment in education were driven by the American need to educate and assess large numbers of people. So a lot of the push came from America. Almost all the science came from Britain, which really makes it interesting because when the multiple choice question hit, it flipped. And all the science went to America. So the science of psychometrics then began to drive the whole American language and other testing industry, while in the UK, it went the other way. For me, that was really interesting. I always call it the, La the Atlantic Divide. What I call the Maryland decision, which was the um, Association of Modern Languages of Maryland, got together in 1913. 
and they decided that you really do need to test speaking. It's a very important skill in terms of language, but it's impossible. So let's go the other way. So they went that way. In the meantime, in the UK, Cambridge exams came out with the same year, the same Cambridge proficiency in English test. They looked at the psychometric side and they said, nah, and they went the other way. So you had two completely different notions of what assessment was about. One notion of assessment was about numbers. It was driven by numbers, driven by the psychometrics. The other side was about validity. What was the test doing? What was in the test? The obvious problem with both of them was they were both rushing off in different directions without ever really talking to people across the pond. The actual talking across the pond only began to happen in the 1880s, or 1980s, 1990s. Where now, when we think about the kind of assessment that goes on, if you look at a test, if you're familiar with the, the IB TOEFL test, one comment that people make about that is, it's an American test, but actually it looks like a European test. Which amuses me and bemuses most of the Americans, because they feel, as they do with everything else, do we have Americans? We have one, I heard an accent. I'm going to insult you now in a minute. Americans think they've invented everything, whereas we know that the Irish probably did. <laughs> but, but we're not conceited. So the IB TOEFL is based on an integrated skills approach to assessment, which has been around in the UK for many years. In fact, the TEEP test was out in 1983, so a little bit of history. Test validation theory has also been changing. From the 1950s, we had an idea that validity could be established by looking at a test from one of three different perspectives. A construct, the traitor ability being tested, the content, what was actually in the test, or the criterion, a, a, a comparison of performance on the test to performance on a test of a similar ability or trait. So we got evidence from any one of those, bingo, we had a valid, valid test. By the 1990s, that had, this had completely changed. We had people like Messick telling us that actually validity is a unitary concept. There's only a single validity, and that's construct, and it's made up of all of these different types of evidences. But at the same time, things were moving in terms of the test use. So that in the 1980s, when people like Cyril Weir, Don Porter, Arthur Hughes at Reading University were frowned upon by their American colleagues and were put down as being real world testers because they weren't interested in psychometrics, they were interested in what's happening out there in the real world. We're not interested in that. We're interested in the number side. To nowadays, we talk about a socio-cognitive approach to assessment, where we try to look at how assessment fits into society. Now, the most up-to-date versions of that thinking is happening just as we speak. I was really interested to hear some of Monica's comments about involving stakeholders, because as far as I'm concerned, that's the whole point. And if you can't involve stakeholders in your theories of validity, you don't have validity. And, but trying to do that is really a challenging and an interesting concept. But without stakeholders, you've got nothing. So, but that's where the social cognitive approach comes in. We're, we're looking at both the cognitive aspect of language use and the social aspect of language use within the context of the test which sits in a social context. So it's got to be in those different dimensions. If it doesn't fit in there, if your, if your theories don't fit in that paradigm, you don't have a theory that works. In my opinion, of course. The world is turning, of course. It's changing all the time. This is an old classroom, even before my time. Classrooms themselves are changing radically. The way people learn, the way people interact with learning, is changing all the time. We know ourselves that when, when most of us went to university, if you wanted to get access to knowledge, you went to the library. 
Now, I haven't been teaching for a few years, but even when I finished teaching, I had students who'd finished their degree and would never, ever darken the doors of the library, ever. They didn't need to, because everything they needed was available online. Nowadays, we have a library, an assessment library where I am. Most books remain undisturbed, because almost everything we need is available online as well. So the way we interact with knowledge, the way we interact with each other has changed. You know, we, we have a team, for example, on my team in the British Council, who are spread over four different countries. So when we have seminars, we can't hold them live. We've got to use technology to help us to talk to each other. Next week, I'm giving a plenary talk at a conference in M M Lisbon, I forgot using technology because I can't be there because I'd be at a different conference at the same time. So the way we're actually inter interacting with learning is changing. Everybody knows that. The whole point of this whole conference, it seems to me, is the fact that everybody knows that, but we're all struggling with ways to deal with it. Because society itself is changing. Once upon a time when we wanted news, we went to a newspaper, the Tipperary Star, of course, from my own hometown of Thurles in Tipperary, a world-renowned piece of newspaper. Um, we would go there to find out what's happening. We, local newspapers, national newspapers. Nowadays, we go to the internet to find out what's happening. I used to have lots of other little things in here, but they've all disappeared. But we also use technology to talk to each other to figure out what's happening. So we're not just going to dedicated websites. We're not just going to newspapers. All of these things are now happening all at the same time. It's not like one has gone. Newspapers are still there. I can still go back to Tipperary and buy a copy of the Tipperary Star. I can actually look at a copy of the Tipperary Star online as well. But I can also talk to people on Skype or Twitter or any other of these things to my friends back in Tipperary to find out what's happening. So all of these things are happening at the same time. So we have this huge cloud rainstorm, if you like, of information around us. There's a lot more information around now than there used to be. When we think about assessment, again, this is not a modern assessment picture. You'll say, well, this is very dated, isn't it? That's the way assessment used to be done. This is how assessment is done now. As you can see, most assessment just hasn't changed. We're still stuck with this mad idea that you've got to get everybody in a room and give them all the same thing. And as long as we are stuck with that idea, assessment is never going to move forward. But this is, I'm, you'll all agree, typical of what you see in your own country. Why is it relevant? I see it relevant because for a learning system to work, the curriculum, the delivery of that curriculum, and the assessment must all be written to the same document. If it's not, it can't happen. The curriculum should drive everything, of course. The way the, cur the curriculum is delivered will depend on the, the resources that are produced by the ministry, by the institution. And that can be everything from the materials that are used, the furniture in the classroom. If you want a, a communication orientated uh, classroom, you have to furniture that classroom in a way that allows that. Like, I remember being asked, I was teaching in Japan some years ago, I was asked to teach communication to nurses. I said, yeah, no problem. So I presented, prepared a course. I got into a classroom thinking, oh, I'll have about 15 people. I ended up in a room like this, just like this, with the same sort of furniture, with 150 students in front of me. And I thought, hey, you know, that, how is that going to work? One of the reasons it didn't work, obviously, was the breakdown. There was a breakdown in the concept of the curriculum and the delivery of the curriculum. And it was down to the, the structure and the size of the class. So it, 
But it would also depend on the kind of training that the teachers are given. So it's everything that helps us to deliver that curriculum is in a bundle there. People don't like this notion of a delivery model, but it's the only one that makes sense to me. If you've got a break in any one of those things and a subtle white line has, begun, has shown in the diagram, if you have a break in any of these, you've got a problem in your system. You could have the most beautifully written curriculum for any subject. If you don't produce an appropriate delivery model for that, the, the curriculum is useless. Or you're abandoning the curriculum in some way. In the same way, if you don't have an appropriate assessment model, you're breaking the link, you're, you're abandoning the curriculum again, and the delivery model. So many times we find that there are no clear links between these three. If you've got a system that doesn't have a link, a clear link, describable link between all of those three, you don't have a system that works. And all problems within education systems that I've seen to date are caused by the fact that you've got breaks in the system. Sometimes it's due to resources, sometimes it's due to a complete lack of understanding, typically that assessment is a vital cog within the learning system, because it is, whether we like it or not. People shy away from it because, maybe because assessment people like myself in the past would talk about assessment in ways that made no sense to anybody except other assessment people. That frightens people off, it puts people off the idea of assessment. What we need to do is to get assessment back into the system so that people understand that all of these elements are closely connected. Why might it be important? I was doing a bit of work on something a little while back for South Africa and looking at some of the international exams, such as PISA and PEARLS. And I came across a really interesting study produced for the HSRC in a government body in South Africa, which demonstrated the, the, the image disappeared. So I've had to recreate the image in a very non-technical way this morning in about five minutes. So forgive the the home and non-home. I didn't have time to think of any sort of a fancier term. But if your home language is the language of the test, your typical score is about 25% higher than if your home language is not the language of the test. That seems to be a fairly consistent finding in South Africa, which appears to be supported in other countries. Now, if we think about it, th that's language. Think about it in another way. If you introduce a learning system that's based around technology, and you equip candidates with the knowledge and the expertise to deliver in a technology environment, and then you sit them down in one of those exams halls and give them a pen and say, write for two hours, you're changing, maybe not the, the verbal language of assessment, but you are changing the physical language of assessment. You're taking it out of a, a technology-driven paradigm and you're bringing it back into a pen and paper system. There has to be a problem. If it's anywhere near 25%, you have a real problem. So it is vital that you get all of these right. And if you're thinking of introducing technology into a system, well, the technology better work at all levels. Otherwise, your system is going to break down. You're going to start getting results at the end of the system that don't match what you expect from the input. Which sort of brings me to the main point of what I'm talking about. The, whole, the main point of what I'm talking about really is this notion of innovation. That when we innovate, where does innovation stop? But before we start this, I will just have a quick run through of the British Council in assessment, just to give you a quick idea. All of my nice charts are gone, so I, this is very fast. 
The British Council got involved in the assessment in 1941 when the Council was asked by Cambridge exams to provide expertise to help to develop English language tests. By the 1950s, the Council was responsible for all incoming students to British universities. That included the assessment of them. And they produced rating scales. I think the first formal rating scales that were out there. Primitive, but formal. By 1960s, the English Placement Test Battery, I can never remember what that's called, was introduced. It was also known as the Davis Test. And that, again, was an English for specific purposes test, but it was a multiple choice standardized test. It was replaced by the ELTS test in 1980. The ELTS test was the first major communicatively driven language test, again, for English for academic purposes. That was revised by 1989 to make it the IELTS. And I don't need to say any more about IELTS. And by 2012, the British Council introduced Aptis. Aptis is a completely different beast of a test, which I'm going to talk a little bit about because that's what I've been working on for the last few years. And that's and where we've put massive amount of innovation because we feel that if you're going to innovate, you don't think small. If, you, if you're going to innovate, you have to think big. These are the various activities that we get up to in assessment. We have an assessment strategy, of course, it's a big part of the business. But we look at all kinds of things from research and development, we support research, we disseminate research. You know, I'm here talking about theoretical ideas today, but often we're talking about some of the research that we're doing. We communicate not only to um, other testers, but to all kinds of people uh, who work with the British Council and who work in the area of education around the world. We have an accessibility agenda because a lot of what we do is to try to make sure that the tests that we produce are accessible to as large a group of people as we possibly can make it to make them. We try to fit with the learning system, and again, I come back to one of the points Monica made. We could have had a chat beforehand, actually. This notion that a system doesn't work at a local level unless it's been localized. So creating systems that test right across a huge number of education domains is likely to fail, because if you have a system that's like that, you're not going to address the needs of specific subgroups. So a test like Aptis, for example, can be localized. That's the part of the, the design. We also look to stakeholder needs, because if we don't look to stakeholders, we don't know what we're doing. And we have a big part to play, I feel, in the assessment literacy agenda, which you can ask me about any of these things later. An overview of Aptis, then. Now, Aptis contains five papers. We have a knowledge paper with grammar and vocabulary and then four skills papers. You can take one or five. Well, actually, no. You can take two. Grammar and vocabulary, everybody takes, plus any skill. You can take one skill or four skills. You can take them using computers, tablets, pen and paper, phone. So that helps us with the accessibility side. We also look at variants. So there's a general Aptis. General English. We have an Aptis for teachers, and now recently an Aptis for teens. And we're looking into Aptis for other areas as well. We've done localization projects in India, Malaysia, Rwanda, and we're looking at others for other countries. I think Austria is one, where we actually work with people from the country to ensure that the test is suitable in terms of the uh, cultural, social, and educational uh, expectations of the candidates. Now that's revolutionary. Nobody's ever tried to do that before. Because it is, we're never going to make any money out of the test, sadly. You know, it, we're not, because you make so many changes to it, it costs you time and it costs you money. But that's not the point. The point is what we're trying to do is just to do something that's very radically different. A test that can be used in different places for different purposes, but would allows for change to be made for use with specific candidates are in specific domains. 
for some reason, the, the last part of this slot is gone. Aptis is delivered online and pencil and paper using the same system, which is uh, built by the British Council working with BTL, which is a company in the United Kingdom. And essentially, what we try to do is we build the tests into an item bank, and then we have people who work from the item bank to build test versions. From there, we can produce pencil and paper copies, computer copies. We have a browser version. We have a tablet version. We have a computer version. We have all the various things. The marking is also also done online, and, and we've learned some really interesting things about that. Between that and a project one of my PhD students did in the UAE, we've realized things like, when you're marking speaking, it's a slow process. So if the person speaks for 10 minutes, it takes you more or less 10 minutes to mark it. When you're marking writing, it's a completely different ball game. Most exam boards and most ministries out there give way too much time to people to mark. We found, and this is found in America with the TOEFL people, found in UAE with the um, CPA people, found for us with the APTA system, that for a, a 200, 200 to 250 word essay, the typical time required by a trained examiner to mark it is about a minute. That's all. You don't need 10 minutes. In fact, there's no evidence to show that taking longer makes it a better or a more accurate mark. There's no evidence to show that faster is better. I used to think faster was better. I was wrong. But there's, it's not worse. So it is as good. So marking quickly is a big part now of our training. Of course, if we were given written feedback, as you would in a classroom, we can't do that. You've, that's only useful if you're in a testing system where you've got to give a score and not written feedback. So the test is a very sound, I believe, uh, technological basis. But within the test, we've tried to create new item types. We've tried to look at the content. We link the content to models of language progression. We look at new and alternative scoring systems, which link the create rating scales for tasks, for example, that are task specific, but are also standardized. We have different and alternative reporting systems. But we also offer a whole range of other areas of innovation within the system. In every one of the areas that I've indicated there, we try to come up with interesting new ways of doing things. And I'm just going to give a couple of examples, which are gone. So I better talk about them. Um, rather than me tell you what I'm going to talk about, somebody give me any one of those things around the outside, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we do. Shout. Validation. Good question. Yes. What we've tried to do is, validation is a mad topic. Nobody really has a clue what it's about. Let's face it. You know, there are lots of theories out there, but they don't tend to work very well. The one that everybody looks to nowadays is MESIC. We tried to work with MESIC 15, 20 years ago, but we couldn't get it to work. We didn't realize it at the time, but it was never going to work. It's too complicated. And it's not clear what the links between the different elements are. So Cyril Weir and myself come up with our own version. Now, since then, I've come up with an alternative version of it. So what we try to do is, in validation, we look to stakeholders. So we try to build stakeholders into the validation process from the beginning, so that if we're looking to create a localized version of Aptis, we don't try to do it in London. We actually go to the country, we put a panel together of experts in, in, in that country, we work with them to bring them into the system so that the test is being created or recreated for them from the beginning. We then look to them to figure out what kind of evidence they need to know. What do they need to know, basically? Not 
what do I need to know as a language tester talking to another language tester? So I'm not going to create a very, I will of course have a very technically accurate uh, validation uh, report, but I'll have a, an additional report that's created for that audience. So we look to the audience for the content of the report, for the driver of the report, and for the actual report itself, so that we're speaking to the right people. Because most validation reports that are out there are written on a, a very high technical level, which most people don't understand. Many times they're written deliberately at that level so that people don't understand them, I believe. So in terms of validation, yes, we've changed the way people do validation. Some people don't like it. Most language testers don't like what we do. Next week I'm talking at a language testing conference in England and I'm going to be attacked because I'm going to be telling them that language validation reports, testing validation reports that we write are written to too narrow an audience and are essentially useless. I'll say that next week and somebody will be jumping at me. Does anybody want to hear about anything else we do? Examiner training. Examiners uh, are trained nowadays using a, a web-delivered training system. So, but it, it, has a, it has, as part of the training system, they go through the usual becoming acquainted with the scales, becoming acquainted with the tasks, getting the usual practice. But there are also chat rooms, there are also elements within the system where they can talk to each other and talk to a trainer when they're doing it, if they're experiencing problems. And built into the system, the training is, we understand that the training can't happen quickly. Normally we spend one day or maybe two days training face to face. If it's done on a computer, it's got to be done over a bit more time. But if you don't build in uh, conversations with the trainer during the system, it can fail. We know from experience and from research that any kind of training is better than no training. So what we do is we do a, a major training system and people have to go through the system, then they've got to do an accreditation test if they pass the accreditation test, they become an examiner. But when they go into the system, the first three scripts they mark are pre-marked. If they don't mark them on standard, they're taken out of the system again. 7% of all scripts that they mark during the marking process are pre-marked. They don't know when those are coming in. If they miss three of those in a row, they're out of the system. So training is something that happens using the computerized system, but it's also going on all the time. So if you're taken out of the system, there's a small catch-up training that you do. And that's usually that works to get people back online. So training is happening all the time. We also try to train people on aspects of assessment. So somewhere there we might have, no, assessment literacy. We have a big assessment literacy project going where we have five different stages. One is an animated overview. Examiners are expected to minimally watch those an animated overviews for the subjects they mark. Then there's a teacher-orientated section, which is about classroom assessment. Then there's academic, then there are MOOCs, and then there are talking heads. So we've got all these different layers of assessment literacy, but that's a whole different talk. I could talk all day about this kind of stuff, but I want to shut up now. So basically, any one of those things, what we've tried to do is to be as innovative as possible right through the system. Because it became very obvious to us that while technology-led innovation is really great, it's fantastic for learners, it's fantastic for teachers, but on its own, it's not enough. That's the point. That's the main point of what I'm saying today. Unless technology-led innovation is combined with innovation in all of the other aspects of assessment, the innovation is really not going to add anything of real value or of lasting value. The key to successful innovation, the Lord only knows. It's out there somewhere. We don't really know what it is yet, I don't believe. But we do know that there's people involved. Innovation is only going to work when you get stakeholders involved, 
and when you get their approval. And you can only do that by communicating with the people from the beginning of the innovation. Because any innovation can only work when people are ready for it. Thank you very much.